headed home finally, waiting on an F train, surrounded by all the flora and fauna of a New York Saturday night. Alley cats and Pekingese, peacocks, parrots, and canaries all drenched in their sparkling best, setting strut to concrete, leaning hard as if cross legs, hand in pocket, inside palm riding high on tile, could prop up a world or an ego or woo a girl. The balls of my feet ache, balls of my eyes too, MTA running late again. The train will be busy, noisy, no room for tired girls with tired minds. I type to distract myself from the ache, the, no the noise, the knowledge of another day short on sleep, another show put to bed, another waking a grumble tomorrow. I see a girl whose eyes are caked in so much metallic rouge, I have to resist thoughts of chiseling it off for her. <laughs> like scavenging her face for copper like a man down on his luck, desperate for a good meal. Her eyes might mean lobster tonight. Maybe then those lids wouldn't be so heavy for her. Maybe then she could open them again and really look at someone. It is a hope, maybe, like the wounded man hopes for the stairs. I don't know, though. She might like the comfort of all that weight. And who am I to deprive a girl her solace? At Rockefeller now, waiting on a D, this station is odd for its meetings. Third night in a row, I've seen old friends meet across the tracks, one on a side, holler and cross at each other about breakups and old jobs and new flats. What's so powerful a river runs beneath the orange tracks to have its confluence here, of all places? On a D train now, I find a seat next to a worker snoozing deeply, hands folded in homage to surface dreams. Two girls stand near me, breaking down the night in gesture and rhythm and laughter and a belting timbre that makes my ears ring. Heavy boots on the sprayed polyvinyl floor echo all the way to the express track flying beneath it. I smile as the girl nearest to me draws me into their stories, convinced of my sympathy. So animated her story of Jamal's awkward attempts to coax her to his bed, my cheekbone seems like a black hole to her elbow orbiting at Schwartzchild's radius. I'm relieved to hear that Maya's adroit at running interference, else Jamal and his pandering might have knocked her sidelong, like an unfortunate comet into the event horizon of me. But my cheek is safe, as still she orbits, elbows flying, limbs a jig, and heavy boots pounding out the sinus rhythm of this city of misfits. Another bitch, another fuck, Another stomp of boot and bell peal of laughter as the mosaic stations fly past. Train rolls into 125, the girls tumble into the station. The worker next to me starts awake and searches oily-eyed for a clock on his stop, worried for a moment he'd gone too far. But he settles again, hips wriggling for deeper warmth in the hard plastic beneath him, content there's probably still a river to cross before he need worry. Working men live in the Bronx, I've discovered. You'll never find a train fuller and more awake at 5.30 a.m. than one rolling out of the Bronx. But as the car breathes a collective sigh of relief and the conductor orders us clear of the doors, the train, still crowded and stiff, falls strangely quiet as the aging doors lumber shut and 60 people reflect on the peace. But it doesn't take long. It is a New York Saturday night. Another bitch, another fuck, in baritone timbre now. Another stomp of boot, another long, low wolf cry marks the orbit down the car. Orange lines, they're loud wherever you go. The train rolls into 145 and I put weight on my aching feet again. As I stand in the pungent air of the station, I stretch and roll my shoulders backward on their blades, noting the cringeworthy knot beneath the right blade needs some breathing deep and maybe some tending to. I walk toward the exit at 147, because that is, after all, the muscle memory path toward home, but I stop after half a block of ringing steps. I turn and head back toward 145, remembering a sight I've been meaning to drink in again. I climb up into the cacophony that is the confluence of 145 and Edgecombe, finding it bustling with the reassurances of slippery lovers, but drowned in quiet as my ears adjust to the absence of audacious noise. I walk a path that became familiar to me even when I was still uncertain in choosing to make this place my home. I slowly and deliberately climb Sugar Hill where it looks over Jackie Robinson Park, running my fingers along the chain link guarding the ravine whose bottom was claimed so long ago and so short a life of knowledge for amphitheaters and barely tamed wildness and deep, clear pools for children to rehearse life's little plunges. I sit on a bench, my bench, my bench, where in my first days here in this city, I enjoyed my coffee in the mornings and my musings at night. I sit here and I just am. I am learning how to enjoy how I've become. Headed home now, up the hill, 
I have to rig in the morning, you know, be on my game so things don't come out of the air. And then a 14-hour drive to follow, but as I approach my door, I realize that the warmth of the evening has likely drawn some thick mist from the river's depths, and I know just how that mist will be sculpted by the fingers of the sycamores that lace Riverside Drive. I should go to bed. But the way that tempered lace is lit by the dense sodium halogen amber and the pulsing light of red, green, yellow, red, green again. Stop. Go. Think twice now. Stop. But now go. Think twice. Stop. But now go. I should go home now. I should go to bed. I should. But think twice now. Stop. Now go. Um, I'm, I celebrated my two-year anniversary in New York yeah. a little while ago, and uh, I, I hear that uh, when I celebrate my third, I can call myself a New Yorker, so I'm looking forward to it. Um, in the meantime, um, I'm fascinated by the subway. Uh, I have a whole series of subway narrations. Um, I don't have a book out, because as um, Philip mentioned, uh, I only got outed uh, as a writer about three months ago. Um, I know it was three months ago uh, because I wrote this piece, and um, there is a... a a piece of news uh, that came out this week that reminded me it's been three months since I wrote this piece. Um, and uh, I really wish I didn't have to read it every time I get up on stage, but it continues to be relevant. And I'm sorry, I'm going to make it a little intense for a second. I don't apologize at all. I'm sorry. No. Okay. <laughs> it's a piece called Rule Book. I was robbed on the subway the other day. Knew it was happening when it did, like you know you're out of air as soon as your fingertips touch wave and you know you dove too deep, but there's not a thing you can do to stop it. it was, I was on a crowded car, not an unusual one, on a Saturday afternoon, and as soon as they shoved me forward and her hand snake round my hip, I knew. There was nowhere balanced to go but forward into her face screaming in mine, my hands trapped in defensive pose by the two guys behind. My, my feet trangled in one train limbs. I yelled, I screamed, I pushed and tried to break free, but as the door slid shut, my voice choked deep in me and I suddenly knew I had broken the rules. I sat at the bar a few hours later, all my arrangements made, cancel this card, change that convenience, pay, purchase, buy, consume the commercial things to keep me alive. Fridge stocked for three days, ID scans printed, important folks paid. I sat at the bar to scribble out my breath, not an unusual night on a rare night free. When the bartender, used to my session, started to refill my beer, I explained the trouble. I'd laid down my last seven dollars for this last moment a few moments ago, and he went on to say that he would buy the beer when you spoke up beside me. I've got her tab. I was grateful. Expressed my gratitude, my bruised and sheepish ego, my gratitude again, and we clinked glasses with smiles and common ground to it could have been worse. The moment before, you launched into an irate and patent recitation of the rule book everyone knows. Everyone but me, apparently. It was my fault, you see. I had the wallet in my back pocket, a place it should never be. Front pocket, you berated me. And I tried real hard that day, I really did, but you don't understand. Have you never seen a girl wearing jeans? These pockets ain't made for following those rules. Having such pockets would lend an unflattering twist to my curve that might not be appealing to your common but discerning eye. No such front pocket exists, not for me. You see, I was following your other rules. Every morning I wake, I have a choice to make. Abide the rules of acceptance or abide the rules of safety. Be palatable to society's eyes or keep safe from its hands. I want you to know I tried so hard, but which of your rules did you want me to follow? I keep my cash in my shoe, my wallet empty of cards, my cards on separate sides, my phone grip solid in my hand. Never put my things in my purse, lest I be purse snatched. Never in my car, lest I be carjacked. Never in my pocket, lest I be pickpocketed. Never in my hand, lest I be slight of handed. I never keep myself in just one place for you because you think me a pitiful thing needs your book of rules. I have to rise up and meet your expectations. That's what you say. Be in just such a way that pleases you with a skirt this short and a neck this low, all made up in ribbon and bow because I am only a look. A tool, a decorative plaything that sits on a shelf, no dreams, no desires, no thoughts or sense of self. A prized thing replaced when a man, a friend, a person close to me, a lucky one who abides no rules, gets clumsy or funny or just has a good time, gets drunk and breaks me wide open. I tried to be sweet, I tried to be pure, I followed your rules of being demure, but that was an invitation, the fine print said. I tried to say no like you told me to say, I tried to refuse, but you set it up this way, and I was drunk too, same as you, but I broke the rules. 
So I don't understand. Why does I just want to talk come with wine in hand? So tell me now since I fucked up because I'm so confused, you see. Am I to be what you want or how you want me to be? Don't wear suggestive clothing. What does that mean? No skirt too short, no leg too high, no neck too low, no jeans tied on thigh. Don't wear my hair short lest I be like a man. No ponytail or braid lest you have hold. So now I don't have a place for your ribbons and bows. So don't rise up and meet your expectations because today I'd be asking. I'm confused now and just so you know, I was wearing overalls when they took me. So difficult to get to my holes, they left deep gouges in me when cutting off my clothes. What rule did I break that day at 15 years old? Dress in jeans and boots with work and hands and I'll never get a man. Be vulnerable and weak, never too strong, because then I won't see what's right from wrong. My little black dress and heels, that's the best way. Until you decide to lay your insecurity, your I want that, it's mine, on me. Your petulant schoolyard tantrums, a sticky drip on my thighs. And I've come to realize you just make up a new rule when you don't get your way. I was not too drunk that night, and neither were you to understand the right thing to do. So I have some new rules for you to abide, because you just can't seem to decide if you are human or beast. And here's the truth at least. You are the predator, and I am the prey. And that I will accept, but you don't get to say that I am guilty of breaking some rule you made up to seem innocent of making me a broken thing. I am done playing a game rigged for me to be blamed. You don't get to set the rules to set yourself free, because you are the criminal, not me. Yeah. 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 I'm gonna tear through this one real quick. Uh, this is another subway narration and I'm just gonna finish this and then I'll be done with the evening. It's called The Thief and the Beggar. On a Q train headed for Queens, a man sits across from me, likely homeless, definitely down on his luck. Head bowing low, he starts awake when the conductor, unaware of the decibels poured from his voice overhead, announces the Astoria destination. Bleary-eyed and still dreaming, the man looks around him, and when his unsteady gaze lands on me, I lock eyes with him and smile all the way through me, pleading somewhere in me not to be invisible, just as he begs to be seen. And in that moment, his eyes become clear and sparkling. We find a truth and common ground that needs no words or fumbling explanation. He reaches timidly into his pocket, never taking his eyes off mine as though I am some doe in a forest clearing he doesn't want to spook. He pulls from his pocket an unopened roll of Mentos, peppermint, my favorite. He breaks his gaze from mine for a moment to admire his treat as though he'd spent the entire day begging for scraps of other folks' happiness for a single chance at remembering some sweetness born from a long ago lost life. He looks up again for a second, losing my eyes behind the lock of hair fallen in front of them. He searches frantically, and when I brush the hair from my eyes, he breathes out deep, relieved his moment is not gone. I am relieved as well. You see, as much as this man is a beggar, I am a thief. I have been called a thief of moments, taking blissful notice of little passings, perhaps invisible to the more scrupulous man, and here I would have enjoyed my time with him without his notice. But what joy for once, not to have to steal a moment, but to have it freely given. He gently opens the foil of the package, leans slowly and carefully across the car, me still the wild thing, him still the timid child wanting to touch my fur. I take, reach out and take the candy from him, pop it into my mouth and smile. He nearly sits straight and proud, obviously pleased for not having scared me running. He puts a sweet on his tongue, carefully rewraps the foil and places it reverently in his pocket. He sits back drunk on this moment, grinning large at me. And we continue our silent conversations for a moment before his eyes start lulling again. This man can't know what he is pulling from me. Tonight, it's summers and my grand folks sneaking out the pasture to ride down to the general store that exchanged every penny and dime I found on the road for bubblegum and pixie sticks until 1985. Every nickel I snuck from my granddad's pocket when he was snoozing in the armchair in the afternoons. My grandma Gavin on the phone next to the icebox or standing at the kitchen window hollering at me for Pete's sake, get out that crab apple tree before I bust my head. Every 50 cent piece Papa flicked at me at the cafe so I could buy a roll of peppermint Mentos. Winking, maybe because he loved me. More likely it was to get me out from underfoot for a hot second while he and Mimi and Miss Wanda and the pastor finished their hushed discussions of the more clandestine political dealings of Roland, Arkansas, population 238. I fingered the deep divot in my shin bone, a legacy of a fall from the pump house roof into the drain pipe which chewed out a quarter-sized chunk of my tibia. I never told anybody about that. Just 
clean myself up at the spigot and insisted on wearing jeans for a week in the custard thick heat just to hide my indiscretions. Seven years old, and I'm already practicing to be invisible. I study the contours of this man's face as I study my granddad's when he was snoozing, like memorizing a road map back to a childhood I'm afraid I've forgotten or maybe never had. You see, I'm just a thief of moments, and this man only a beggar of joy. But tonight, we are royalty, sucking on the sweetness of lost history, savoring moments that can only be known to a thief and a beggar. I rise slowly to exit the train at Astoria Boulevard, stopping to steal one last moment in a kiss on top of his head. You see, tonight, we aren't invisible. Tonight, we are seen. Tonight, this man matters. And so do I. Thank you guys very much for your attention.